Chapter 15. Walter Migas sat behind the desk in the shop's lunchroom. He leaned his chair back and propped his heavy steel-toed winter boots on the table. His jacket was wide open, and under it, he wore a flannel shirt tucked into his jeans. Chief Terry paced back and forth while Dave Migas pored over invoices, charts, and documents about energy consumption. With Evan and Isaiah looking over his shoulders. To Evan... The numbers just bled together over on the page, and Isaiah looked equally be bewildered. Dave was muttering to himself, and neither wanted to interrupt him. The front door blasted open, and a rush of cold air followed. Evan's parents stomped in, shaking off the snow that had fallen into their hoods and coated their shoulders and sleeves. Another snowfall was blanketing the community. Gibarkimna, called Dan. You boys hungry? He held a big steel pot almost as wide as his torso, and Patricia carried bulging black canvas bags in each hand. Her glasses had fogged up in the sudden warmth, and she peered over them as she walked towards the small group. Dan dropped the pot onto the table suspiciously near Walter's feet and chuckled. Walter pretended to scowl as he dropped his, his boots to the floor. Got some stew for yous, Dan said. Pat's got the bannock and bowls and stuff. Here you go, boys, Patricia said as she placed the bags on the table. Chimigwech, Pat, said Walter. No, you guys are the ones to thank, keeping this place going. Well, we're doing what we can. I just wish we could tell everyone for sure when this will all be fixed. Ah, uh, don't worry about it, she said with a shrug. They can cope. Most of us didn't even have hydro or running water when we were, when we were kids. Yeah, people around here sure got soft, eh? They both cackled, and the men around them chuckled. If only they knew, Evan thought. Okay, well, we better let you, we better let you boys get back to work, said Dan. Enjoy the medium. Chimigwech, they all said, almost in unison, as Evan's parents walked back out to their truck. What the fuck are we supposed to tell people anyway, blurted Dave. We'll get to that, Terry replied. We can't let this get out of hand right now. I'm hungry. He went to the pot, filled his bowl, grabbed a piece of bannock, and sat down. Evan followed suit and sat down next to him. The bannock was still warm. His mouth watered and he realized he hadn't eaten since early morning. He dipped a corner of the fried dough into the thick liquid and shoved it into his mouth. The savory sauce overpowered even the heavy salt in the bread. Before long, all of the men were eating. Back at his table, Dave swallowed his last bite and spoke up. <clears throat> All right, he said, looking down at the sheets of paper spread out before him. I have some good news and some bad news. What do you want first? Don't fuck around, Dave. Just tell us what we need to know, ordered Terry. Dave slid his glasses down his nose and pushed up the sleeves of his gray hoodie, revealing the faded blue tattoos on his forearms. Fine, he said rearranging a few of the sheets. According to last year's energy usage, we have enough diesel to last us until the end of February at the latest. That's what we thought all along. But if we push con conservation on the people like we've been doing since we fired these back up, we may be able to stretch that until the end of March, maybe even April. It all depends on how much wood people have and if they get lazy. Since there's no guarantee we'll even get diesel again, I recommend we go ahead as we have been. We may as well ease them into spring. If people don't play along and we end up losing it all halfway through the winter, there'll be total fucking chaos. There'll be, for sure, there will be death. We have to break the news to them soon, Terry muttered, resting his face in his hands. People are antsy and they deserve to know. We'll hold another meeting. We're in a crisis and everyone's survival depends on cooperation. They're going to panic again. It might get ugly, but it has to be done. Eventually, they'll get used to it. When should we do it? Asked Dave. Tomorrow afternoon. That'll give these boys a chance to get the roads nice and clear. And this time, we definitely have to feed them. How do you suggest doing that? Said Evan. The cash. That's the only way. Stored in a bunker below the garage at, a wa at the water treatment plant was a massive cache of non-perishable food for emergency measures. A fortified secret pantry was also hidden behind one of the garage's brick walls. 
Thousands upon thousands of cans and boxes have been stored there for nearly two decades. Connection to the world to the south could be disrupted so easily. So the chief and council of the time had passed a resolution outlining a well-maintained and updated cache of goods that could keep upwards of 500 people fed for at least two years. Few people beside councillors knew the extent of it or where it was stored, although its existence was generally known. Gossip spread quickly in the small community, so those with specific knowledge of the food cache had kept it to themselves to protect it from raiding before it was actually needed. No one had ever really taken a prolonged disconnection from the South seriously, though. We'll decide what we'll need to get out of there that morning, Terry went on. It won't be that hard to heat everything up. There'll be more people than last time. All right, agreed Walter. He turned to look at Evan and Isaiah. Evan and Izzy, you guys go get Tyler and start plowing wherever is needed. Then, it looks like we've got to send out more notices.